Welcome to the With Winning in Mind podcast. I'm Heather Sumlin with my brother, Troy, and you just made me watch. I, actually, he didn't just make me watch like I wanted to see it because the Kentucky Derby happened. I had I didn't watch it because I don't know what I was doing, but apparently I missed like the best thing ever. So you just made me watch the race, which is all of how many seconds? It's really short. It's like two minutes. It's, it's a, It was the coolest thing I think I've seen in a long time. Yeah. It was so, so cool. So this is how it, it makes how, me want to go to the horse races. What was interesting is I didn't watch it because I was working mm-hmm. that day, and then Brian kept calling me. Right. So our brother, our brother. kept calling me and going, "Hey, you, did you see the race? Did you see the race?" I'm like, "No, I've got a full schedule. I'll, I'll talk to you later about it." He goes, "Well, you've got to YouTube it. You've got to watch it." Okay. Well, then a, a friend of mine, Roy, calls me that night. Now, one, I've never talked to Roy about any sport related stuff, right? You talk to Roy he, all the time and you I never know, talk sport talk related. About, uh, uh, we're not we don't talk about sports. Okay. And he said, like, Did you see the Kentucky Derby? I'm like, no. Well then he, instead of telling me to look at, at it, gives me literally a play by play before I could well now there's no reason for me to even watch it because he literally gave me a play by play. Yes. And so but then other people started it's on the news, you you got more people it's the everywhere. next day asking you stuff, and so you're like, okay, I've got to, I got to find out what's about. So you look at YouTube, boom, Kentucky Derby. You watch it. One, well, the announcer did an amazing job. I mean, it was excitement just to listen to him was excitement through the whole whole race. But I kind of like watch. I kind of enjoyed watching it, knowing who was going to win. So like hindsight, because then you could see how far he actually had to go. Yeah, that was cool. He, and then for him to be what the alternate. Yeah, he wasn't even in the race. Twenty four hours before the race started, he wasn't even in the race. Another another horse was pulled. Don't know all the details with that, but they basically, hey, you know, we got a spot. They want twenty horses. Mm-hmm. You're next in line. Apparently, they have four alternates that are there just in case okay. with injuries and who knows what happens. So they go, yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, they want to race, so they put him in there. So here you have a horse that's never run the track. You have a jockey that's never run the track. A jockey that's never been in a, a big race like this. You have a an owner that's never had a horse like in anything near a, a big race like this. Of course, the Kentucky Derby is probably the one of the biggest. Mm-hmm. But at that level, whatever the, the levels that they have of their, their competition, mm-hmm. didn't have anything racing against that type of competition until this horse that he had that he literally got six months earlier Six or eight months earlier, in a thirty thousand dollars claims race, which means he bought the horse for thirty thousand, when other people pay like five million for a horse that, that is so cool could potentially win mm-hmm. the Derby, and then you have a trainer that just not that long ago lost twenty three thoroughbreds in a in a catastrophe as a facility burned down or something like that and so here you've got a you've got a great comeback story of here's a trainer that's coming back has never had a horse at a big event like this mm-hmm. he's had some success but he's kind of going from here and then you have a a jockey that no one knows and you have an owner that no one knows and i mean here's the owner sitting there going like well i just want to dabble in the horse racing and enjoy it and that kind of stuff and what do i do and this trainer's like well you probably want to do xyz and that's kind of his world and the next thing you know they get this this horse and he's doing okay in some of the races and then all of a sudden he i think wins a race and they're like do do you think we might have a derby horse i don't know you know it's too early to tell and then it's like you know i think we might you really think we do i I think i'm not sure so there's a lot of this (laughs) build up to the race and even at the race after they win they don't believe it So the post-interview, if you haven't watched the post-interview of the Kentucky Derby, it is a must-see post-interview with the trainer, the jockey, and the owner. The way they communicate with the audience, Mm -hmm. they edify everyone. It's so genuine. It's amazing. I need to watch that because I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. So it made me think this. It's like we're watching this sport, and, of course, it's a horse race. I mean – you're kind of there. The jockey's there by himself with the horse. So mm-hmm. it's just him and the horse going. So it's kind of like golf. It's like and shooting and archery where it's more of an individual sport than a team sport. It's not like basketball, soccer, that kind of stuff. 
And one of the things I realized is that, you know, there isn't anything, there's no such thing as an individual sport. Right. It's perceived to be, but it's truly not. It takes a team to get to the top. So there's like an individual athlete, but that athlete needs a ton of people. Correct. Like the jockey wouldn't have gotten where he got at the Kentucky Derby if he didn't have a good agent to find the trainer. Him working with the trainer, if he didn't have an owner with the horse, provide the horse. There's a lot of things that go on from a team approach. And what you see in this post interview is it really is a team approach Mm -hmm. with the owner, the jockey and the, and the trainer, even though they halfway through this journey of trying to qualify for the Kentucky Derby, the owner and the trainer are talking about options you know, what well, if we did get in the Derby, would we want Sonny to ride or would we want someone else more experienced? And then, of course, it's like, well, why, why would I want anyone else on the horse but him? He knows the horse. Mm-hmm. He's my guy. And the owner's like, yeah, I was thinking the same thing. I just wonder where you were at. I mean, they wanted to make sure they're on the same page. It confirmed they're on the See, same that's page. that's smart. So they, their communication is, is really strong. Their relationships are really strong. Everybody's on the same page. Good team. Yeah. So it makes me think. So we, we talk about this a lot. There's four things people have to check. If you don't check the, the these four things off, it's going to be very difficult for you to be successful. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the first one we look at is, do you have the time to do it? Like If you do not have the time to do it, you can't do it. So if you look at it from the owner's perspective, here's a guy that wants to get into horse racing. Well, obviously, he he's from the oil business. He made a lot of money. So he's kind of semi-retired or retired he's like you know i got time to do this okay so you check it but the second one is do i have the money to do it well can, in other words can i really afford to do what i'm about to to get into can i afford this hobby and if you can't then you got to find a way to do it right right so he's sitting there going like well i don't want to spend millions of dollars i just want to enjoy racing and then he's like realizes when he gets with this trainer that okay you know i can do this and it's affordable and it you know if it works out to where I can get to some of the big races. Great. But this is going to be something I'm interested in. I want to do. But he finds a way to I can afford this, and I'm going to go that direction. So that kind of reminds me of just making opportunity, like creating opportunities, like the story that you like to tell about Michael. Yeah. We told the micro ghost story before. So I, I won't I'll, go into all I'll, details of the story. I'll link to that in the comments so that people can go back and see because it's a really great – Finding opportunity, finding resources where you don't think that they exist. Yeah, if you if you don't have, so Michael didn't have the funds to go work with the team to get him on the national team that he wanted, but he found a creative way Mm -hmm. to afford to do it, and that's really what the thing is. If I don't have the actual money, can I find a way to afford to do it and make it happen? He did that in a very creative way, and next thing you know, a year later, here's a guy who's Right. Competing in international competition, representing his country, which is the goal that he wanted to accomplish. Then you, so you look at the third one. The third one, I think, is the big one: is are you really willing to put in the effort? You know, everyone says they are until it comes crunch time to do it. You know, are you really willing to put in the effort? So when I'm working with one a, with young athletes, I almost said one athlete. But young athletes. I hope you're working with more than one. <laughs> so when I'm working with young athletes, high school, collegiate level athletes, it is amazing to me how many of them think they're putting in the effort. And they're not putting in the effort. Not what they need to reach the goals they're telling you. Right. You know, I know when I was at the, the Army Marksup Unit and I was training, I know how many hours I trained a week. I know how many shots I trained. I know, how, I know what I did. Do, have you saved your journal? Did I what? Did you save your journal from back then so that you could – know for sure how many hours no i've lost i've lost a lot of stuff over the years moving stuff gets thrown away see that could be worth something well i do have my first ever one you do yeah with my first targets i ever shot got them cut out and posted it i do have that you have your first performance analysis Mm -hmm. yeah very first one that's so cool i think on our patreon channel you should show that So, like, for our Patreon members, we do an exclusive, like, membership for our Patreon members. It would be really cool if we could get Troy to open up his journal. I could tell you I've come a long way (laughs) in my career from that first You don't want to admit what it looks like? Yeah, don't look anything (laughs) like today. Or the target's not great. (laughs) Don't look anything like like today. Even more important, you should join our Patreon so that we can embarrass Troy on 
our membership site. Yeah, but it takes <laughs> it takes a lot. If you want to try to be really, really good at something, if you want to be one of the best at what you do, right? I don't care if it's even at the national level, not even the international level, right? You're going to have to put a lot of effort, and that's are you willing to do that? I see a lot of people, they say they do, but then when you watch them train, it's like, well, you spend half your time talking. You're not spending half your time training. You're just talking. That, yes. And so it just bothers me. That you're, you're not being honest with yourself from the effort standpoint. Mm -hmm. But you get people that are like, oh, no, effort's not an issue. I'm, work ethic is not even a question. Okay, then you get to the fourth one. The big one I think is crux is, do you have the right people? in place to help you reach the goals that you want and in many cases that's the one thing that's missing you know if we're working with like golf for example those first three aren't an issue most of these golfers time money and effort not an issue they're they got they got are you them. talking about like professional players or no i'm talking about players or all i'm talking about high school level athletes that want to go to college i'm talking about college players who want to go pro i'm talking about pro that want to get to mm -hmm. the next level in all these cases, those three things they can check. The fourth one is what's missing. They don't have the right people in place. And if you look at the top level guys in the world, they all have a swing coach. Okay, so they, they have a, a go to guy to make sure that they're staying on top of their technical part of the game. They all have a caddy that helps them with course management throughout the course and and in other ways that helps them out. They're in many cases gonna have a fitness guy to make sure that they're staying fit and then in, in some cases they're going to have a mental coach and a nutritionist and so it can be a huge ordeal if you look at um, mixed martial arts they they have a team mm -hmm. you know they have a boxing coach they have a jiu-jitsu you know coach they have a nutrition they have a group of people that they rely on so when they go into competition they're in the best situation they can be to be successful but when you look at it, what we see as an individual, as a fan, is we see, oh, it's an individual sport because they're doing it. We don't see all the preparation leading up where behind the scenes it takes a team. So the biggest myth, I think, in golf is that it's an individual sport. So nothing can be further from the truth. It takes a group of people to get to the top. So the question is, do you have the people for you to be able to get to where you want to be? So what are the qualifications for what type of people you need. Not necessarily the, um, I guess it depends on your sport, as to if you need a fitness coach or a, you know. But is there, are there any parameters as far as what type of people you should be looking for? You need a, multiple coaches. Um, usually there's fitness element, there's nutrition mm -hmm. element, there's, you're gonna go um, fix your wounds because you're gonna get injured and you're gonna have injuries. So yeah, there's a lot. I think when I think of pageantry, um, that's a huge team sport and team effort, but it's not um, recognized that way. I think people just think that individual just did it all themselves, and that's not ever accurate. Well, I think a lot of people don't understand what goes on in that world for them to win. In a lot of cases, if you don't know anything about it, you're just saying, oh, it's just whoever's good-looking and has a good talent, they win. They don't even know that over a third of the score is in an interview that we don't get mm -hmm. to see as you know, people watching it. And so if that is a big take, then you can sit there and go, well, why didn't that person win? Because they were really good. They obviously had the best talent. But if you don't know how the scores are broken down, when in other type of sports and, and activities – it is easy to break down. That's why I like rifle shooting. It's easy. Who had the best score? You know. You just look at the score. Oh, there it is. You know, that's why golf is. I mean, you look at the leaderboard. You know, okay, who's number one? You know, who's second? Who's third? Who's fourth? And the judgment category, you don't know. Well, you're talking about subjective graded sports. Pageantry, you're right. We don't know. Uh, as an audience member, you don't really realize how is this scored? How is it graded? What are the requirements? The judges have an orientation ahead of time where they're told what they're looking for in each phase of competition. And what's interesting to me is that the girls have a very large team of people typically that they're working with. So a lot of times they'll have a director, then they'll have sponsors. So sometimes they'll have sponsors that they have to work with. 
And then sometimes I'll have people that they want to work with or that they choose to work with. And sometimes the sponsors are those people. And that makes sense. So there's a wide variety of people, whether it's their fitness people, their interview coaches, their walking coaches, their directors, their parents, their, you know, regular support team, all of them, um, nutritionist a lot of times, all of them play a part. When you have the right team in place, it makes it easier to get closer to becoming that person you want to be to be able to win at the level that you desire to, to win at. And you'll see people make changes. Like mm-hmm. in, in golf, some you know, a player will make a change with their caddy, and it can be huge. Mm-hmm. You know, I know two examples of that. I know when Jerry Kelly moved with Eric, that partnership worked really, really well. In fact, they I think they've stayed together for – over a decade, you know, and when you look at uh, Fred Funk back in the day, when he was working with Mark Long, mm-hmm. they had a long, uh, good relationship. No pun, no pun intended. Yeah, Correct. Long. No pun intended. But <laughs> when you look at the way they communicated, the way it worked, the you know, it's like, okay, you know, you're really good at this. This is a strength. I'm really good at this. This is my strength. And then together, you know, they work really, really well and so you have that dynamic and sometimes you need to change you see people that okay i'm going to i'm going to change you know coaches Mm -hmm. they change coaches it's better we see that in the shooting sports Mm -hmm. where people make a change in in individual sports you're responsible the athlete is responsible to put that team around you in Mm -hmm. team sports you're not you go to the team and they put people around you and so when you you see some people they go to a team and they're not very successful. And you're like, why? And then they move to another team, and they're very successful. I'll give you a one that's really, really good. If you haven't seen One Giant Leap, you need to watch that. What's that? That when? is about Luke Longley. So in The Last Dance, The Last Dance is a was a, a documentary series on, you know, the Bulls won three Wait, what sport are we talking about? We're talking about basketball. Okay. Chicago Bulls. I have to, I don't know any names. Okay. So Chicago Bulls, Michael mm-hmm. Jordan, they win three NBA championships, right? Okay. I know Mike, I know that name, Michael Jordan. He takes a break. He, he goes to baseball. Well, he comes back, and they have three more championships that win. Well, that okay. last year, the owner decided, okay, you know what? After this, we're going to break the team apart, kind of start over. And so their coach, Phil Jackson – coined hey this is our last dance meaning this is the last oh. time we're going to be able to play together okay. last season we're going to make a run for it literally they're a dynasty and they're going to solidify the dynasty well their center this time in the in the last this three-year journey here is luke longley well in the last dance they don't even mention luke long they don't interview him they don't talk about him but I think he was a pivotal part in them being able to win because he was a role player. He played a specific role that was needed. Mm-hmm. Without him, who are you going to have handling other dominant centers? You know, and we're talking about Shaquille O'Neal was. Okay, I know that name too. Yeah, one of the the best centers, if not basketball players, ever to play the game. Because we and, talked about him when we talked to Jim Poteet. Yeah, and so when you look at when you look at that. Later, a person's like, well, wait a minute. We, why want Luke in there? We, we should do something mm-hmm. with him. So this guy has an idea of doing it. So, well, Luke is in Australia now. You know, he moved back to Australia. He's got a whole different life. He's retired from basketball as far as playing. I think he does some coaching now. And so this guy does an interview with him and talks about his journey. So here he is. He, he gets basically sent to the United States playing in um, New Mexico, flourishes with that that team, winds up getting drafted, and gets with the team, I think it's Minnesota, and he just didn't do well, just floundered. But then when he gets to Chicago, he plays great. And it's basically the the surrounding, he's around people that, like he had a high work ethic. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael Jordan is known to have a high work ethic. Mm -hmm. But other players around had a high work ethic. When in the other teams that he was in he's like man there's just some people are lacking in certain areas so he didn't have respect for them and you know you didn't have the right chemistry it takes a team then he gets on a team is like oh my gosh i could do something with this and he was okay with being a role player he was okay he's like, i know michael's gonna make all the, the shots i don't i don't have to be the guy to score a bunch 
but I need to help them. So what's the best way to help them? Really, really good documentary. Watched it several times. One giant leap. One giant leap. Okay. Yeah. But it's a case where he is in a team with the right team. He had the right people around him. He was successful. Earlier, he didn't. And so it's like, well, wait a minute. What if we what if we can help this guy and he can help us? And so putting a team together around you, that's why you see people move from one in team sports, the move from one team to another, and they're they're more successful. And I think it's it goes back to that people. They have the right people in place where for whatever reason they didn't connect, didn't you know, it just wasn't the right fit for them. Mm-hmm. Now you can see the opposite sometimes where they go somewhere and it doesn't work out. Because they don't have the right team. But having people in place is very, very important. And it's hard to to do. I don't think it's so easy to do. I think when you're looking at having the right people, you have to look at who is going to build you. Who is going to build your self-image and provide an an opportunity and an environment that helps you grow. As we talk a lot about being balanced. And in order to be balanced, your self-image has to be built. And your environmental influences can either make or break you when it comes to your self-image. So I think that's a key component that you need to be looking for is how are they communicating with you? What kind of environment are they providing for you? To me, that matters. Yeah. So put a good team around and you'll probably be successful. And if you're in an individual sport, you're not doing it alone. You never make it to the top all by yourself. So surround yourself with good people. Make sure that you're putting in the effort, taking the time, and that you can afford to do the goals that you're reaching. And we hope you have the most success possible. Yeah, and be like other people. Hit that subscribe button and like button. Absolutely. And go watch the Kentucky Derby if you missed it.